But I want to tell you that the future of education is here because of technology. Uh, technology has done so much in, in, in advancement within the commercial in the space that you know we're actually getting some of the benefits here in education. So one of the big things that's uh, trending in education is intelligent tutoring systems. Now that pretty much means that like you know with using uh, data and, and algorithms, we're able to determine uh, different ways to approach each student uh, through through data mining, through analytics, through a whole series of different things. So what we've done is we've taken that and turned it into a personal digital tutor. So uh, we're targeted tutors. So every single student has a tutor. So I want to see uh, who's here right now. So anybody uh, here a technology coordinator? Uh, no, no, not sure. Yeah, technology tutor, but technology coordinator for a district. Yeah, okay. Now I just want to let you know I gave a talk to the, uh, about this topic last year as well. Good mix of people. So, any curriculum developers out here? So, no curriculum developers. Okay. So, we're all classroom teachers, right? Actually, I am on our on our. You're on the team, the board. Yeah, the team. Yeah, there's the team. Okay. Any uh, any directors and uh, administrators in here? Right. One. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so, um, oh, and other people that I might have missed. You? Technology coordinator, but instructional technology. All right, so you kind of like do a little bit of both. Yeah. There we go. You're a melding of the two. We'll, we'll count you as both of us. All right. So, um, so what's your dream in a perfect learning system? Can anybody chime? I know you you've just mentioned some some really great things that you've learned about. I mean, in a, in a perfect learning system, when you look at it and you say. What skills do our students need to be successful and competitive in a 21st century global economy and global market? And really, that's the reality. I, away from high stakes testing, away from mm -hmm. EOC, the in, at the end of the day, they're going to go out in the world and they're going to perform some skill or they're going to do some type of job and they're going to compete in a, in a global market in this information age. Mm -hmm. So right now, you know, what soft skills are we giving our students for them to be successful? And you've got juniors and seniors that are just now figuring out their senior year. I don't know how to use Microsoft Excel, or I don't know how to collaborate online. Uh -huh. I mean, what, what are they really going to do, yeah. you know, when they get out there with a company? You know, what do companies really expect? But they sure can collaborate online on video games. <laughs> yes, video yeah. games and text and Snapchat. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how do you make that bridge that gap into from that, from that, and actually, that's a nice session. We're going into that in great detail. So, anyone else have have, have a dream? Yes, it's very similar, but a little bit more personalized. It's helping each student really find their passion, and you know, I think in a way that is going to lead to their success. But helping them find their passion and then be successful in achieving that. Mm -hmm. uh, Finding, the, finding their passion in education. Well, but we already know they all have passion in education. So. <laughs> so, it's something a little bit more marketable. Yeah, yeah, more marketable than that. Although they have been making some good money on that. Maximizing their potential. Yeah, exactly. So, so those are really great examples, you know, because you know, we're all pointing towards like, you know, personalization, getting to them uh, in, in various ways. Uh, so looking at the current state of education, you know, we, we, we all know that assessments are key. We're all driven by assessments, we're all driven by reports and endless amounts of paperwork and paperwork. Because we're all we all we care about is like that, that that one exam. And that sets the bar for everybody. You know, obviously we know that you know it, it is not key. You know, because the problem is, because of that, what are you doing? Teaching to the test. <laughs> exactly. And that's not doing a great service for the student. So uh, so so when I look at the, the landscape, and I'm sure you do too. You know, there hasn't really been any change in the pedagogy of, of the classroom because of that mandate, you know, and because we're, we're, we're forced to go down that route. Uh, but the change really needs to happen, you know. That's because this system was built on a 1920s factory style of education, and we haven't really changed that, you know. And there needs to be a big global change, uh, oh no, but a national change in that sense for us to really, you know, push forward. So that's what I'm really dreaming about is that, is that, uh, we're not still stuck in the 1920s. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about me, just to kind of give you a little relationship as to why I'm standing here in front of you talking about this. 
Well, first off, I'll let you know this. I, made, I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, exporting here at a tender age of two. Uh, when, when, when my family came over, you know, uh, we opened up a, a Chinese restaurant. So we, you know, we had uh, barely anything, and then we opened up a restaurant and started to you know, build ourselves that way. Uh, living really poorly, uh, mind you. But while I was growing up, you know, my first language was Chinese, so that means my second language was English. So I had a problem uh, in the school system. You know, I, I, I didn't understand uh, English very well, and I had a problem reading. So I actually made it through uh, high school without reading a single novel. I have a problem processing uh, the written language. So, so that, that led to a lot of problems, uh, which a lot of people call ADHD, because I had a lot of energy, but I couldn't focus on, 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 on single tasks very well. Now, you know, for my parents, they had to deal with it because we were poor in a Chinese restaurant and they didn't have money to send me to a psychiatrist to put me on drugs. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> because I learned, I had to cope with it. And my parents had to cope with it, you know, bless them, uh, on, on this aspect. You know, and, and you probably have to cope with it with the, your, your students and probably people you know. But really, it's not a problem because I had to learn to harness that and turn it from my greatest efficiency into my biggest asset. So now, I'm actually able to, as compared to my peers, focus on so many more things at once, not get overwhelmed, because I'm able to process all that information, not linearly, but multifaceted. You know, when I'm playing video games, which is something that I really gravitated towards, oh, um, it's, uh, you know, I'm able to, to, to react so much faster uh, that, uh, that it's really a great asset for me. Uh, but you know, because of that, you know, I actually failed a math class. Now, can you believe that a Chinese kid <laughs> fail a math class? Come on, <laughs> it's unheard of. So, so you know, that's because in math class, even though I knew the stuff, I was bored, I was disconnected, I was sleeping half the time, and, uh, and but then you know, like I said earlier, like, I gravitated towards video games because it held my attention, it kept me engaged, it threw a million things at me. You know, I'm actually uh, to the point where, like, you know, if you imagine, like, you know, like in the Matrix when like bullets come flying at you, really slow motion. Like, if I'm, if I'm playing a game, it kind of feels that way in a way. Not really, not really, but like, you know, I, I, I'm actually able to like do things that and have reactions that I just uh, are unheard of because of that aspect. So, so I love video games, which led me to computers, and then pro I, self I taught myself programming. Where today, uh, I'm a really strong digital, digital learning specialist and advocate. Now, uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because I wanted to build a system that works for me. You know, because these kids that you're having problems with, you know, I went through uh, a, a time ago, and you know, I have a dream that I wanted to build something that, that uses technology, you know, and my love for video games in such a way that you know we can engage kids that are disconnected because they don't fit the model that we are uh, all stuck in. So, so we wanted to. Okay, I, Said that. You know, I build a system that works for me. <laughs> so here we have, uh, you know, one. This is a really funny clip I like to throw in there about how kids are used to having information at their fingertips. Oops. Oops. While you're loading, can I comment on something you said previously about how the model hasn't changed at all? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, comment. I just had a grandchild and I thought, you know, my school situation is so much like my daughter's. Hopefully by the time he is in school, it's going to be different, mm -hmm. but it's not very helpful unless something really changes. Yeah, and that's what we're here to, to yeah. push down. <laughs> push down. Yeah, I think change is coming with the passage of the recent rewrite of the NCLB. Mm -hmm. That's that's a step, a small step, but that's... It's, it, but it's, it, we have to take baby steps. But we, as educators, need to take those those leaps forward to, to kind of pioneer that so that they can react to it. Unfortunately, it has to be done that way. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. <laughs> Look, I googled it. It's a fake pigeon. <laughs> Just kidding, boys and girls. Everyone gets cake. <laughs> so uh, I, I love I love Big Bang Theory. Anybody here a Big Bang Theory fan? 
Yes, yeah, it's engineers and scientists doing their everyday things, and it's actually true to life. So I have friends exactly like that. In fact, I'm kind of like that too. So, so the thing is, like, you know, I love that because, like, you know, kids are growing up nowadays where you know they expect information right there. If they have a question, they look it up, they Google it. They, uh, they, they never learn a, a world where we actually had to fight really hard and spend a lot of time to get to information. You know, we actually had to transport our bodies to a library, go look up a, uh, a car catalog system, Dewey Decimal System, or you know, we're a chef, like, go find that stinking article in the microfish library that you're researching. You know, how much time is involved in just researching and finding information where now you could just ask Siri, you know, you know, I need to know something about that. And then you have that information right at your fingertips. So, so these students and these kids are growing up with this model, this idea that information is a, is a given right to me, not something that I have to go out and fetch. And here we, uh, and the system, the education system is tailored in such a way where we're saying we can only, we, we have to give you the information in this format and we feed it to you because this is the only way we you know how to do it. So, so that's, a, that's a really, I love that. So, um, oh, and I need to pass out. To, uh, <laughs> I always forget, so I have to put a little reminder. Of so basically, uh, this, uh, I'm recording the session and, and I'll be emailing you PowerPoint and, uh, a uh, invitation to try an experiment, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, well, actually, I can talk about it. But, uh, basically, uh, the, the stuff I'm going to talk about is only open to, uh, it's a closed beta, so only open to people who apply, and we don't want to, everyone to do it. So, so the invitation is, is very like, specific, uh, and I'll show you what it's all about later. So, so basically, you know, Technology is, is actually very fascinating you know, because, as you know, it's, there's a huge rapid growth. In the past five years, there's a huge boom. I mean, you, you, you've seen it. Like, you know, it will all of a sudden went from like, you know, just uh, wiki sites and blogs to now you have Google sites and, and that grading tool and, and all these things. And it's, it's so exciting because, uh, because people are actually investing money in education as opposed to uh, not like before. So, so I'm really happy about that. Uh, but the problem is that, like you know, a lot of people are just building tools to substitute a current process. Like this. so, they, they've been doing a thing in a certain way, and they just want to substitute it with technology. So that's not true innovation. That's not that's not uh, reimagining the, 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 the possibilities of that. So and, and like I said earlier, no, there's no real change in pedagogy. So you're just doing it with technology, you know, uh, uh, and uh, and doing it the same way. So that's why I bring up this you know, the standard model of technology integration. Anybody here familiar with this? Yeah, I just saw this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I think uh, every every uh, everybody who's into technology, who's uh, who's look at it, you know, really needs to look at you know why they're what they're doing with the technology and why they're doing it. Is it just a substitute? What you uh, are are doing in the classroom? Is it is it is it augmenting it? You know, taking it to the next level. But what we really want to focus on is modification and definition. Yeah, because that is where uh, true innovation happens, and that's where. Where you, you get the oh my gosh, you know, this is I'm never going back to what I've ever doing before because this is like leaps and bounds better. You know? yeah. So another thing I've noticed is that a lot of the tools that are out there are teacher centric, you know, designed to make your lives a lot easier. You know, that's not a bad thing, is it? No. But the thing is, is it good for a student? No, no, because then they're like oh gosh, you know, this is another corny thing that I have to do for to for my teacher. Gosh, you know. So, 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 so they hate that because you're just shoving another uh, tool down their throat that you know all they want to do is play Minecraft. <laughs> so, so I mean, one of the big things is like you know when we look at technology that we're offering at you know uh, doesn't solve everything. And, uh, and in this case, the uh, lights, please. Thank you. Emma. <laughs> so, 
Thank you very much. Um, I love throwing in little clips and things like that, just, you know, just to keep everyone awake. But you know, it, it's just funny. You know, we have to be truthful. You know, technology can solve a lot of our problems, but there's certain sort of still things that we need the practical path and, you know, that, that, that's necessary. So for a, for a lot of teachers who, who say, "Am I going to be replaced by technology?" I say, "No. You know, we have a place in everyone's lives. We." their mentors, we are their guides. We need to be there to facilitate it. We'll never be replaced. Okay, so, so one of the big things uh, that you know, we experimented with, uh, that a lot of people have was uh, uh, we wanted to build, we built a relationship between content and outcomes. Uh, uh, so to best explain that is like, you know, you have a book and you're teaching a class and let's say all your students got Bs. Is that correlated to the book, or is that correlated to your teaching style, or is that correlated to the individual student? Where is that correlation? There really is. There is no direct correlation to that. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is like you know, how, how we actually build a direct correlation between individual content elements and outcomes, and that yeah, that builds a huge amount of data. But on top of that, allows us to build an adaptive learning. So so a lot of people don't focus on that because they think content is just one thing, and then learning is another thing. And separate the two, but there actually is a direct relationship between each. So uh, one of our big challenges that we faced was like, how do we get uh, hands-on visual students to learn book materials? Uh, so because we, we deal specifically with, uh, you know, what, uh, coming from a culinary arts background, with CTE students. So so with that with that type of experience, it allowed, allowed us to formulate a system that's not designed for, let's say, uh, you know, Ivy League scholars, but for the, the the really, you know, down to earth, like you know, kids who aren't, aren't responsive to anything to get them to respond. So I like to, you know, uh, talk about this because I, I really believe that uh, our uh, entertainment industry has heavily influenced our kids. Um, so over here on the left, um, or I mean, yeah, right, the left, uh, we have like these classic, uh, iconic cartoon characters. So, so what I'm trying to illustrate to you is like, you know, you probably grew up with these characters, right? You know, you know he likes the cat, remember Smurfs, uh, SpongeBob, or who, who doesn't love Mickey Mouse, right? So, so, so you, you, you sat in front of the television, you know, watching this entertainment, being told stories about uh, these different characters, you identify with them, you love them, you know, you, you buy like trinkets about them when you go to Disneyland. So, so you become enamored with these characters uh, as you're watching television. Yeah, so basically, your parents sit you in front of the television, you're sitting there, you're absorbed in that kind of content. Then uh, come uh, school time, you go to the classroom, and you sit down in a nice neat rows, and then you're being lectured at by, by uh, the teacher. So that worked, right? Because you're being told, this is how I'm growing up being entertained, this is how I get information, so that happens. But then the 1980s happened. You know, we've got video games coming out. Uh, with uh, you know different characters here, like you know, who doesn't love Mario? Any Mario fans out here? Oh, okay, <laughs> only you. I love Mario. Um, so we got Mario, and we, so kids are identifying with these different characters: Sonic, Link from Legend of Zelda, like Snake from Metal Gear Solid. So, so what is happening is like you know they're identifying and loving these characters because they're actually controlling their lives. They're they're in control with the controller uh, here, the masters of their destinies. They're making decisions about what's going on, and they're having fun doing it. So now these kids are being trained, hey, you know, my form of entertainment is now controlling, it's immersive, it makes, I make decisions, and I do all these things to get to an outcome. Sometimes I might have to do it 50 times to get to that outcome. Sometimes I might be able to do it four times to get to that outcome. You know, but they keep doing it over and over again. So, so since, since video games came out, you know, uh, as kids get got into it in the 90s, and now you're just seeing that generation of gamers, then how are they going to react when they come to the, to the classroom and they're sitting there and they're watching you lecture? They disconnect, they close down. Because they go, okay, where's my control? I'm so used to doing this for the past 10 years of my life. Now I'm being told that I don't have control, I don't have the ability to do that. I'm not getting the feedback that I need, I'm not you know, getting the gratification. So, so we're facing a whole entire new generation of people who are at this level. So we, we need to be prepared for that to happen. So this is a theory that I've been working on for the past five years, researching things like that. So I always like to love to get the audience opinions. What do you think about that? I think it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. It makes good sense. Mm -hmm. There's a data support. 
Yeah, that's the day's fun. Yeah, if we were to do a research study, we'd find it out five years later. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a whole entire stuff. Another angle of education that I love uh, this day. <laughs> so, anyway, so yeah, so we got these kids. They need that, but we're not giving that to them. So, uh, but this is my last video, so I'll go ahead and flip that up and then bring it to it. But this is basically a really quick description of, like, let's say, let's flip it around and say, In the 1990s, Douglas Rushkoff coined the term screenagers to describe a generation that, for the first time ever, was growing up to think that images on screens weren't just something to passively stare at, but instead were something to be manipulated. But today, it's even more extreme. The tools and connectivity provided by the web allow us to think of images on screens not just as things to manipulate, but as things to project our own identities onto. Not everyone who does this is a professional storyteller or a claimed poet or coherent. But content aside, hyperlinked webs of human expression are incredibly rich environments and they exercise the brain more so than books. Well, for the sake of argument, let's read From Everything Bad is Good for You, a book by Stephen Johnson. Now, in this passage, he imagines a world in which books were invented after video games and the World Wide Web. Kids everywhere are starting to read these newfangled books, and teachers and parents are concerned. He imagines they might say something like this. <clears throat> Perhaps the most dangerous property of these books is the fact that they follow a fixed, linear path. You can't control their narratives in any fashion. You simply sit back and have the story dictated to you. For those of us raised on interactive narratives, this property may seem astonishing. Why would anyone want to embark on an adventure utterly choreographed by another person? But today's generation embarks on such adventures millions of times a day. Reading is not an active participatory process, it's a submissive one. The book readers of the younger generation are learning to follow the plot instead of learning to lead. So, um, this is a video from uh, uh, a YouTuber on uh, that, uh, his name is Vsauce, so you, you, you want to search for him, Vsauce. But he does a lot of like instructional videos and for informative, informative videos. Uh, it's really fascinating, some of the things that he talks about. But, uh, but I caught that on the wire, and I was like, wow, you know, that's, that's exactly what I talk about. So, uh, and really great way to contrast the fact that, you know, these kids, we're throwing them backwards in time, uh, where, where they're used to controlling their, you know, rather than being forced out of the path. So, moving on. <laughs> so we talked about video games uh, and gamification. But you know that uh, video games uh, is a quintessential part of every kid's life. So studies show that 97% of, uh, of kids ages 2 through 17 have played video games or are playing video games. I mean, it's, it's there. It's pervasive. It's like, you know, it's in your pockets. You know, anybody, any, any candy crushers here? <laughs> yeah, if you all will. Yeah, get your, get your cells off that sauce there. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and I play games too. Because I'm going to see addicted to it, and I know that. <laughs> um, but how do we harness the, the principles of gamification? And, okay, so first thing we did is like you know, we want to break things into like you know smaller pieces. So instead of a chapter or a passage or or a section, you know we want to we want to teach concepts and have them uh, master the concept and provide them some feedback. So so one of the this, so we call it the automatic remediation and mastery system. It's automatic. And then we take them through a remediation process to master the content. It's really cool uh, how we do it. Um, so, like I said, you know, we wanted to be a digital tutor, personalized learning environment. <laughs> so, so we have cons uh, we track things at a granular level, and basically, you know, this is an uh, image of like you know how we display a, a project. So, first off, you know, we we have our you know quintessential badge. You know, Badging is a huge thing, micro credentialing. So you know, if they complete this project, they'll earn this badge, and you can see that this student is about 90% done with that uh, badge. Then we have things. So uh, what we're going to focus on right now is the, the remediation engine, which is a part of this entire project. So here we have, we want them to master these content uh, areas. 
So the best way to describe it is like, uh, I'm a student and I just assigned, got assigned this project and I have to learn these materials. So there's text, there's video, there's, there's audio, whatever the content is to support these topics here. So I go in and study. Now, what's the first question I ask after I've been studying materials? Did I learn something, right? So normally you would go to the end of a chapter and then take a silly little quiz and go look up the answers that you got wrong. Is that learning? No. So we, we, we basically said, okay, we want you to check your knowledge. We have a button that says check your knowledge. It's not a test or a quiz. Well, actually, it is a quiz, but we don't call it that. Because we want the students to say, hey, you know, I studied this. Let me check my knowledge. Kind of like making it to a checkpoint uh, on, a, uh, on a level uh, in a video game. So they click on that, and they get taken to an assessment. Actually, there's hundreds of assessments, because we want the students to become, to become assessed on lots of different things, on, on many different levels, to basically build a picture about them. So this assessment is taking, so the system, we call the tutor, so the tutor is actually saying, hey kid, I'm gonna ask you questions about each of these topics, and I'm gonna figure out, do you know it, or do you not know it? And then I'm gonna give you instantaneous feedback about that. So we do it through through these uh, high-level uh, models, so IRT, which stands for Item Response Theory. Item Response Theory is basically an algorithm that, that measures the, 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 the collective data of the, um, the questions and actually determines the weight and value. So if, if there's any like if there were curriculum designers in here, then, then we could have a discussion about that. <laughs> uh, so we also utilize abundant assessments, which is uh, which is you know instead of just having one assessment or two assessments, we want them to go through dozens of assessments because it's all about progression and growth. Um, no repeated questions, which is very important. Uh, utilizing Bloom's taxonomy as a way to measure the uh, the, the, uh, the the depth level of the question, uh, and we want the, the, the entire assessment process to be constructive rather than destructive, because who loves to go in and take an exam, right? No? So, so here's the feedback, you know. Um, the feedback allows you to be able to, actually, oh, there's a question. Feedback, you know, soon tells you um, remediation. Um, we also can actually find out behavioral training so that we actually can see how students behaving in the program um, because we have all this historical data. And our entire goal is to build confidence. So let me show you how, how that's done. So here is like the results screen that we're seeing. So this is basically saying, okay, the student has just taken that self-assessment or that check, that, that knowledge check. Uh, these are green uh, squares. But first off, we tell them what level they are. They either are novice, apprentice, or scholar. So, you know, so we have like uh, levels that they build on. Then, we have uh, these topics. So these two topics, we're saying, good job. You have proven to be the tutor, and you know this. So we're going to actually move that content from your main block and set it aside. So good job. You don't have to spend any more time on it. But these areas here, now, I find problems there. So spend your time, focus on these areas, and study them again. So now the student knows, has some definitive direction as to what they're doing. These are actually yellow, but because the projector is discoloring it for some reason. Uh, but uh, but these are like uh, mains that begin in red or yellow, which means that you're okay. So so you go back and you study that material, and then you come back to the tutor, and the tutor will question you again on these various things, uh, on these the various topics. Now it's not the same question because we want to determine did they learn more or not. Now the questions are actually uh, tailored to every single student based on item response theory. So in historical data of the student would actually influence how the student. Uh, how, what kind of questions the students get. So let's just say that, that during that quizzing process, uh, we say, you know, you've actually learned more on this one. We're gonna change this from red to yellow. Good job, you know, so you see growth, you see progression. Now let's say this one turns green, then we actually move it out of the content one. So we're narrowing the focus. So the, so the net result is like, you know, targeted time so they can become more efficient. Then on top of that, so they're seeing, uh, they're actually remediating the content that they need to really focus on the most that's giving them problems. So our job is to say, you know, focus on this, do it again, do it again, do it again. Let's narrow the focus down more and more. So, so that's how, that's basically a, a, a form of gamification because they're seeing progress, they're seeing that they're you know, diminishing their workload, and they get a very good focus. Now the system that I'm telling you about here is an open system that allows you to put any kind of content you want in it. And I'm just giving you examples of of how the system functions. And we actually have teachers who, uh, who have done this 
with other subjects. Like we started out building in coloring arts and actually have seen phenomenal success. You know, now we're working with uh, a publisher uh, who does like STEM education, and they're seeing amazing results. But we also have like teachers who have who are teaching business finance, where we don't have any subject. They put their own content that they found online. They already had it all all gathered, but now they're putting in a system where it actually intelligently gives the, the student the, the questions, answers, and shows them growth. So that is showing great success. Actually, the, the funniest thing is like you know I have a teacher who is doing this uh, for the past year and a half in grade school music education. Yeah. Go figure. I, I, I primarily target high school, and she somehow found it. So it's amazing that uh, the thing. So the thing is like you know our results are, are staggering. Like two to three times learning rate, a lot of retention of information, increased engagement. That's all of what, uh, the, the stuff that we want to see happen. Um, but you know I have to tell you the truth. You know we're not the only ones experimenting with this technology. Pearson's uh, been doing it for a few years. Wiley is doing it. With, so they're actually putting, trying to put their books into a learning system that's similar. But the problem is it's a closed system where we have an open architecture where you know we basically say, hey, uh, I want to use this with uh, Wiley, but then we go, I want to make some changes. They say, no, no changes. Sorry, it has to be the way it is. So, so there are closed systems out there, um, and it makes sense because they're trying to protect their property. So, so how do we get to artificial intelligence? Uh, um, it's all about Google. So you know how Google uh, has been gathering data on everybody for the past like decade and a half, right? Uh, so that's that's a bad thing, but a good thing at the same time because you know, with data you can make intelligent decisions, and it's helped Google turn into the multi-billion company they are company they are today because they're tracking the usage data, search trends, finding out what's trending, and they're reacting to it rather than uh, otherwise. So, so let's remember that you know how Amazon with their mega sale the other day and uh, <laughs> uh, the, and Netflix, you know, they track your your the way you browse the products and movies. Uh, so, so taking that similar approach that commercial entities has taken, you know, we're doing it with uh, education. We're going to track and figure out that instead of like, building a personal shopper, we're building the, the personal uh, tutor. So, so we actually do that. You know, so, is it Big Brother? Well. It is in a way, but you know, it's, it's actually the way that we're training it. Uh, and and uh, we look at assessments differently too. So what is an assessment? Is it just the test? No, it's not just the test. We're actually tracking the behavior, like you know, how, what they're looking at, what they're looking at, how long they're spending on pages. Uh, so uh, hundreds and hundreds of assessments are being built, and this data is being used to build a profile on that student. Uh, so it's more than just did you get a certain percentage on a grade, uh, which, which allows us to be able to create that personalized learning. Um, so like I said, you know, we actually build two, three hundred assessment points for every single student uh, and everything. It's quite phenomenal data mining. But you know, that's the beauty of technology is that we're able to build this uh, and actually do something constructive with it. Now, we actually think of students as sensors. So, so uh, one of the, the developer of this, uh, this who, who built like the, the entire assessment algorithm, you know, used to work for uh, uh, NASA and. Uh, Power plant, and he had to build a sensor node to track information to be able to predict whether a piece of part or whether something in the nuclear reactor is going to fail. So he had to build all the sensor data, analyze it, and then predict outcomes. And that's one of the things that we do. Also, is like we, could, uh, we actually have an algorithm in there that, that you can put in, crunch the numbers, and it'll tell you what grades your students will get with it with the level of certainty, which is pretty freaking you know. Um, so we build that learning behavioral. Uh, um, Profile. So, um, we kind of, what we do is we want to personalize the experience, uh, do content course correction. So, so basically, like if students going through the content a certain way and we see that they're trending wrongly, then we can actually make adjustments to that. Uh, do comparative analysis, just to compare them to from one student to another. Yes. When you say we, are you saying the computer program? The does program, it? yes. Okay, so it's not the teachers monitoring the data and no, you, you can look at the data, but it's, it is an automated process. So there is uh, there are manual processes in here that allow you to be able to to uh, grade certain things and do, do checkoffs, uh, like for uh, for uh, so so we're uh, talking a lot about automation using technology. Uh, Dropout prevention is, uh, is uh, you know, for for the colleges. It's really important to see if somebody's like starting to trend poorly, so you can send them to a counselor or something like that. Uh, big data analytics. Uh, Big data analytics is very important as part of it to do performance reports, 
uh, and actually this is a, a big, big piece is like, you know, is the content effective? You know, the, the content you need to throw your students after you throw it, if you've had like a dozen, you know, a hundred students go through it, is it actually uh, as effective as you think? Maybe that content needs to be a tweak. You know, like I said earlier, a lot of people weren't building co content co correlations with outcome. Like, you know, you, you, you find something wrong in the textbook, the only way to find out that's wrong is you pick up the phone and call the publisher and say, hey, you know, page number 87, there's something wrong with it. But how often does that happen, <laughs> realistically? So now we can actually see direct uh, uh, correlation to that. And the system gets smarter over time because it's, uh, it's content agnostic. So what that means is like any content you put in there, it creates it as a data node point, and then it starts to gather data through experience uh, um, as it interacts with uh, you and your students. Okay, so let's see here. So project-based learn, <laughs> project learning, let's see what time is it? How much time do I have? 20 more minutes. Huh? 20 minutes. Oh, 20 more minutes, great, I'm on time. <laughs> and, and, and I want to encroach on the next presenter, boy, would he be, would he be really bad, which is me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, but uh, so, so yeah, in, in PBL, like, you know, so we really want to focus on the problem. So we define the problem, then we, then we provide content, which is why I showed you the mastery of the content. Now we're gonna go into the next stages, which is like submitting evidence, uh, grading rubrics, and then uh, earning the badge. So, so here we, we're back to this picture again. You know? So this is the, the, the problem you know, uh, that we state to the student. You know? Here's the content. Here's the steps involved to solve the problem, which you know, goes into a lot of description on that. And then, uh, and then the next thing is like, you know, uh, like I pointed out, they'll first they check their knowledge to make sure that they know their, the stuff. Then they come, they come over here and they say, okay, now, now these are the things that I need to submit to my teacher to, to earn that badge. So the, the evidence can be in the form of like a, a reflection question or, or a number of reflection questions, a, a file submission, uh, and then there's a, a grading rubric which can be used for like you know, essays or, or presentations and things like that. So, so this, I mean, it's really simple what it is. It's basically a, a checkoff. And, and when you build a project, and I'll show you how we build projects in, here in a bit, um, you determine like how many reflection questions you want. The more reflection questions you ask, the, the, the more, the, you know, the, 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 the piece of the pie has to travel before it gets completed. So if you have one, then they ask, answer that one question, you let it, bam, you know, they, they, they make it to the end. Um, then, um, but if you put a lot, then you know, they have to do a lot more steps. So uh, the data in PBL is very important. We track you know, evidence-based learning. So we want to have that historical data that uh, is part of the student profile. And this is actually a very important part of like, you know, how we do the micro-credential, because now they have the mastery data and the, the, the micro-credential, which can then be uh, Problem then can be like transported to like other services such as like LinkedIn and say, hey, you know, I participated in this class and then I got this this badge uh, and it could be worth something, something. You know, and this is also the important building point. You know, so we have a provide a pathway for evidence. Uh, it can be used for earning certificates um, and building that profile. So, so like the, the pathway evidence could that also be used for. Student profiles. Yes, exactly. So every student, when they have an account, that profile is with them. So even if they leave the school, they'll still have that historical data, which they can be. So for interviews for college or scholarships, and they've got their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's the the digital the, the, the digital portfolio backpack exactly. You know, that that's uh, that's basically you know what we're doing. And we're using open standards too in the in the sense that like you know the the, the, the data can be. And not only utilize in our system, but utilize in other systems that, that use the same APIs. Yes? Um, for example, if for one of their reflection questions, they have to upload a file or something, does the system store that somewhere? Yes. Are you able to access it? Yes. So if the student logged in, they would essentially have a portfolio of yes. responses. Yeah, exactly. That's okay. good. So that would be a part of that whole entire thing. So gotcha. they uploaded the file. Uh, and you're notified about that file upload or, or, or something like that, and then you check it off uh, in the process. Um, and I put this up here because this is a uh, very long time. I asked uh, Jonathan Hack, who actually attended this session last year, uh, um, actually, it's really funny because like, he, uh, he asked me about two dozen questions throughout the, 
the session. He seems really, really interested. Uh, so after he reviewed, his, him and his team reviewed uh, our system and compared us to like uh, the Buck Institute and Project Boundary and various other things that they're looking at, I asked him, hey, can you write a short uh, little testimonial or a little like, about like, what, how you felt? So, so I just threw it up there. I'm like, oh, but yeah, Ed will know, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, but I just wanted to say, like, you know, we went through a very long vetting process um, with, with this team, and, uh, and, and he loved us. So, so I just kind of wanted to throw this up here as a, uh, you, know, um, you know, that people really, you know, when you think about these things, you really you know, have to be really serious about it. You, know, you can't just go in half assed kind of way. You want to, uh, you know, really like, devote some good time and resources. Yeah, you know, yeah. You could do a few experiments, but then if you want to implement in the classroom, you really have to do it. Otherwise, it's just going to fall flat in space. That's just to be honest. With you. But fortunately, you know, we make the, uh, the the system very easy to use, so that you can build these things quickly and easily. Like, you know, I had a teacher build like a, uh, a semester's worth of their entire course offering in less than a month because they have all the materials. They just had to ass assemble it uh, their system. So. Um, um, last thing is like you know, we really want to focus on multi-modality learning. So by using all these digital assets, you're actually able to combine everything together, utilizing kinesthetic, audio, video, uh, whatnot, into one cohesive um, uh, program, which then the students can go through and master. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into like uh, like I said earlier, this is a private beta. So uh, when you did you, you guys all filled out the uh, Email. I'm going to send you an email with the, the uh, video, but, but we're not looking for just anybody. We want people to, you know, who are really going to know about this to be part of this uh, private beta. And the people who have that, we're, we're actually going to invest time in you. We're actually going to handle and you know, walk you through the process. So, so it's an investment for us and, and you at, at the same time. We're not just going to throw it out there and say, good luck. You know, we're at, you know, we want you to be successful because we're building something truly amazing. And the more teachers we have, Using this, the more feedback we get, the more things we can, the more amazing things we can. Uh, for the for the multimodality, and that's I think that's a key. Yes. Because there's students and us. How did you learn that? And us students and one was like, well, I learned it by listening to audio at night, yeah. or I would listen to a song. So when a lesson is built into that, they have the option of mm -hmm. uh, any. I can learn the lesson. You know, I can try visual, yeah. I can try you know, yeah. kinesthetically. Yep. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, yeah, and, and actually, I, I actually uh, uh, speak about that uh, quite a bit. And uh, the way I like to uh, make an analogy is like everyone learns different, right? Just like how you go to a buffet in Las Vegas and you pick something different, you pick something different, you pick something different, everyone has different tastes. So that we have just as many variety of learning styles. And if we are able to build this buffet of Choices for students, it's going to be a win-win because then, you know, then they have a, a choice. That, you know, maybe they need to learn math better through a book. Maybe they learn uh, uh, language better through audio. Of course, they learn better through audio. But, but you know, um, <laughs> there's a lot of like you know great choices. And the thing is, you're building this digital asset, these digital assets and digital reservoirs, to be able to start you know creating that multimodality. So um, we got ten minutes here. So let me show you. Uh, in the last 10 minutes, you know, what we're talking about with, with uh, learning system. Um, oh, and I, I forgot one of the most important screens is this is the screen where you get to monitor your students. Um, I forget the number, but uh, so you can see. Well, unfortunately, the reds are all muted, so there's yellows and reds in here mixed in here that you can't really tell. Is the gray like not attempted? Great, that means that you haven't done any work in there. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So you get a really nice overview um, of, of the class, and you can actually uh, see it in different uh, formats, uh, um, such as like you know, how much they progressed through the content, uh, how much time they spent in it, and things like that. But let's go ahead and get into the actual building aspects. So I'm going to show you the tool set that we give you. It's pretty easy. So here, uh, you know, so this is basically what our, our offering suite, which um, uh, is like, you know, basically we're setting up in such a way where you're building a book. So we we're building a book that created one called High Schools at Work. So if I want to create another book, I click on Add and then create another book. So within a book, we have uh, a variety of uh, options. You can create another book, so you can do a book within a book, or you can create a module, which is basically 
a repository of information, or you create a project, which is a repository of information with project-oriented goals. So there's two ways, because one is just book knowledge, and one, the other one is project-based learning. I would recommend doing it in projects, because that way you can set up uh, uh, more goals. So let's create another project here and some title. So within the project, you have different fields that you can enter. You can do a title, you can add descriptions, uh, materials that are necessary to, to complete that project, resources such as PDF documents. And over here we have what are called concepts. Now concepts is the, the actual meat of the, uh, the project, which is the, the content that is necessary for them to be successful. So one of the examples is like, you know, let's make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So that's one of the first concepts you need to know about is bread. So this one will be about bread, you know. And then, you know, we create another one. Uh, let's say we found a uh, website about uh, peanuts. So we put a web link in there. So I'll now actually embed a website right into the whole entire learning system, which, you know, over here we go like this. This is a page of content. So Uh, and yeah, you know, so you have a variety of options. So, you know, let's say you have a uh, YouTube video that you want to embed. So if you know how to embed, then great, because then you can embed virtually anything. So you can throw in some embed codes. Uh, so, so the key is like you're creating these different concepts to reinforce and build on that uh, on, on this project. You are going to check the knowledge list and, and use that information to complete that project. Um, then we have a badge which you can upload, and then. We have additional steps if you want to create additional steps at the end, you know, you know create completing this project. Then we have evidence. So evidence uh, comes in the form of these uh, four different types. You have a great evidence, which is basically saying, I want my students to make it to apprentice level, so that you know to qualify. If they don't make it there, then, then that, that, they'll never earn that badge. Or if you install it, that's what we need. So then you can do prompts. So I'm going to add like two or three prompts and a file submission and then a grading. So then we have these prompts, which then, you, know, you can enter in whatever you want for your reflection question, uh, a file, so you can say upload your PowerPoint file or something like that. And then let's create a rubric. Let's do a uh, one, two, three by three, three by three grading rubric. So basically, uh, so um, with the grading rubrics, you don't have to fill in the information because if you title it and you have like this key, that you can just like use it as a you know, through. And when you grade it, you have, each, each box uh, has a value to it, and it will actually assign a score to that, uh, to that student. So, so now that we've created the evidence, uh, the last thing you need to do uh, within this process is you've added the concept, let's say you've added a website here. Now you need to add questions. You know? So remember how we go back to abundant assessments? Uh, the simple principle is you cannot assess a student on a piece of material with only one or two questions. That's not enough. You need to create a lot of questions. Now, not, I'm not saying not a lot, but I'm saying like, you know, like six to eight questions per concept. That way, when the system goes and picks questions, they'll have a choice. And as the system goes through, look, just think of it this way. I'm your tutor, and, and let's say you're the teacher, and you gave me two questions about this topic to assess all of your students on. I'm gonna say, I need more than that, right? I need, I need to make decisions and choices. I need, I need some more, more things that I can uh, try to make, make the, to, to gather data. So we say six to eight, because that way we can actually, you know, through our um, algorithm, determine which questions are more effective, less effective, harder, easier. That way when I'm the tutor and I'm asking the student a question, if, if I'm asking them a harder question and they get it right, uh, then, then it's gonna be more value to the student because, because of that versus an easy question, which like let's say, eight, of the students get right, then it's like, well, you know, most people get right, so I'm not giving you a, giving you a lot for that. So, so you can, so you understand that, that aspect of, it. you know, so we have like different types. So you can do a true false, a multiple choice, a figure, which is like put an image in there, uh, image, image, figure, image, uh, short answer, and uh, essay is only there because uh, we have a, a robust test building system that actually lets you add essays to a printed version, uh, but we don't do essays. Automated process because it's a little too hard to create that. So, the, so basically, you see that you know, the the entire way that the the uh, Cape Cup system is built is wizard driven. So, I don't know if you've used other systems before. Uh, like, you know, I know Moodle is a beast, and so is Blackboard. If you use them, 
those before, but you know, when you, all it is just like uh, fill in the blanks and click on the various things to make it easy to like it, click on the big red X. And then you can. Canvas. Yeah. And actually, Canvas is a big improvement over uh, Blackboard. <laughs> Marginally, right? <laughs> but the thing is, like, you know, I want to you know, kind of distinguish the difference. Like, Canvas and Blackboard are, are learning and management systems. Uh, we're, this is a content learning management system. So we don't have the learning management systems that uh, aspects like Edmodo and Canvas and Google Sites does, which is like communications, board discussions. Our, the entire focus with this is to get content in the hands of the students, give them great feedback using intelligence so that they can learn the materials. No other bells and whistles are needed for them to learn that material. You know, we throw in the, the necessary, things, necessary things to build gamification in. So, so, uh, so when you, if you do accept the invitation, and I hope you do, um, you'll find that uh, there's you know, a lot of really great ways and approaches to to building this content. And even as simple as like you know a simple project too. Let's say you wanted to go really fancy and do a multi-layer project. So a multi-layer project is really awesome. So let's say this project required. This is like a project like you know, uh, it's like build the Apple Tower. You know. So within the build the Apple Tower. You know, the first project you need to learn is uh, Memoirgy. So we have a mini project within that. Uh, so one, one of the project requirements is to complete uh, Memoirgy. <laughs> and then another one is to work with the Freemasons. <laughs> you know, so then, so that within a project, you can have multiple layers in which will contain additional content. So, you know, so there's going to be a page, page, uh, page. So user-friendly interface. You're not going to two different pages between description. Yeah, those of you who've had experience with other systems and things like that would make it stupidly easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, without doing the work for you, of course. <laughs> um, and then uh, basically, uh, uh, after you build this. Then, then you would then, then you know be able to distribute it to your students, and then have them go through the content, and then get uh, feedback from it. So, uh, so that basically, uh, is, okay, I gave you a little demo of how it works, but I just wanted to kind of show that it's it's easy to use. We want it to be that way, uh, but also very very powerful at the same time. So, uh, any questions in the last few minutes here um, before I conclude? Ready? <coughs> All your questions. So, I get uh, your general thoughts. So, what do you think about the, the dream that we have with, with adaptive learning? Um, think it's possible? Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, exactly. All the engagement. Exactly. And that's what we are aiming for. So, I think it's possible. I think what we're really what it comes down to is. You know, with stripping budgets, you know, and the districts, you know, have to make choices about where I spend my money. You know, we struggle with, you know, at the bottom of the list is always ban. Because, you know, we want to, you walk in our building, it says we get a great way for social skills for students, but we really don't. It looks good on the side, though. Yeah, yeah, good. yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, so, you know, we want to create, you know, thank you very much. They, of the intelligent system. So, uh, you know, so when you play around with it, we hope that it becomes a, a successful tool for you. So thank you all. Thank you. Oh, and if you want my business card, I have some up front here. All right. Start your video. Oh, yep. We start the video.